So it's been my privilege to, this semester to teach the Frankie Seminar with Professor Hazel Carby on race and caste. And it's been delightful to have Ilona Katsu here with us today. We've already met with her with class, and this is uh, a wonderful experience to have her interact with us in several uh, venues here. So Ilona is the curator and head of Latin American Art Department at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. She's the author of numerous publications on Latin American art, and has been responsible for the installation of the museum's permanent galleries of Latin American art, no small feat. She has been responsible for major acquisitions of historically important and modern works from Latin America, and she's created many uh, important and field-changing exhibitions and conferences, um, not just at LACMA, but also in New York City and Mexico City and other places. She's intrepid in creating and in delineating the field of Mexican and Spanish colonial art that has its own specificities, rather than being understood simply as derivative of Spanish European art. She grew up in Mexico City, and that history and her training in modernist art also has led her to curate Latin, Latino artists as well. She's, I hear, um, working on a show on 1960s Latin American art, and one on Spanish colonial art, which will be very exciting. She is one of the world's leading authorities on Casta painting, the author of Casta painting, images of race in 18th century Mexico. And this Casta painting is what she will talk about today, um, examining how concepts of the Casta uh, came to emerge in Mexico in very specific social and historical contexts and whose meaning and practices changed according to shifting colonial policies. Right? And she's written not just um, a magisterial book on Costa painting, but also edited Inventing Race, Costa Painting in the 18th Century in Mexico, um, and these are and a book with co-authored, co-edited with Susan Dean Smith, Race and Classification, The Case of Mexican America, that came out in 2009. Her mandate of expanding the works in, at LACMA and American Art World continue in many shows and catalogs, contested visions in the Spanish colonial world, painted in Mexico, 1700 to 1790, Pinchy? Mexico. These have all been groundbreaking, including in the shows the Spanish colonial and Mexican indigenous artisans who adapted their work to fit the demands of their new colonial masters and while cunningly preserving traditional methods and motifs. Right? We're so fortunate that she could join us here at Yale. Her talk today is entitled The Invention of Costa Painting, Race and Science in the Age of Enlightenment. Please join me in welcoming Ilona Katsu. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me here today. It's a great pleasure. I want to thank Hazel Carvey and Interpol Grewell for inviting me to uh, the Whitney Institute for having me, and it's a huge honor. And uh, to Saloni Bauman for everything you've done to coordinate the event, which is not a small feat. Um, let me just get settled for a second. So this talk is based on earlier work. My first monograph on Casta painting was in 1996. It was to accompany an exhibition at the American Society Art Gallery in New York. And uh, it was also the subject of my dissertation, which I turned into a book published in 2004. Um, that went along with an exhibition that I organized at the LA County Museum of Art. It's um, it's a long journey. It's sometimes surprising to me that there's still growing interest in this area. And um, when I wrote the book, I deliberately tried to not close off interpretations. It's a genre that's endlessly fascinating, complex, rich, weird in so many levels. And um, I think that there's still quite a lot of studies that can come out from it. Mm -hmm. So uh, I will try to unpack as much of the information as I can in 45 minutes, one hour, which is a very limited amount of time to just go through everything. 
a lot of things will probably get left out. There will, there might be questions. And, uh, but I also want to just keep this at the forefront that it's a genre that is limitless in terms of interpretive possibilities. And uh, the complexities and tensions is something that you will notice, hopefully, emerge um, throughout the talk. So I'm going to just start by briefly introducing the genre for some of you who might not be entirely familiar with it. It's a unique pictorial genre that was developed in 18th century Mexico. Uh, what is remarkable about it is that, and this is the reason why we call it a genre, is that um, it spanned the entire 18th century. So the first examples really originated in the first decade of the 18th century, and the last paintings date to uh, around 1810. So we're talking about a really long time durée. The other thing is that the paintings, um, the corpus of works is fairly large. So we have, uh, the paintings were generally conceived as sets of 16 paintings in separate canvases or copper plates. Occasionally you would have the paintings on a single surface, such as this example by an unknown artist in a private collection. Um, and if you think about this and you multiply 16 times 100, we are really talking about over 2,000 works of art. For colonial art, for actually for that matter also for European art, that is an extraordinary pictorial output. And I always like to sort of keep that in focus because it's not just a sidebar of uh, art history. This was a very, very popular genre. The premise of the paintings, really, and uh, we were just talking about this in the seminar, is to chart the different racial permutations that took place between the three trunks or main social groups that inhabited colonial Mexico. That was Native Americans, Spanish colonizers, and African slaves. And the paintings tell very, sp they, they provide a very specific narrative of this process of miscegenation by really keeping Spaniards at the top of the racial scaffolding and blacks at the bottom. There was this notion that uh, indigenous people, because there were neophytes, they were considered pure in Spanish legislation, but the stain of blackness was considered too huge to be removed, um, at least in these paintings and Spanish colonial mentality to a great extent. Um, so the paintings chart out the possibilities of returning to a wider racial pole. And that can only happen between the, mi the mixtures between Spaniards and Indians. That is, if you have, for example, the, three, the first three paintings of most sets depict a Spanish man with an Indian woman who give a mestizo. The next painting in the set would be a mestizo and a Spanish man would give a castizo. And then the third painting would be a castizo and a Spaniard who would give back a pure Spaniard. So the idea was to the sort of what the paintings are promoting is this idea of going back to a pure Spanish unadulterated, unadulterated race, which was considered to be the primeval color of mankind. However, the mixture of Indians and um, Spaniards with uh, blacks in this system, the Sistema de Castas, would only lead to racial degeneration. And this is very clearly articulated in most of the castas, as we will see throughout the, uh, the talk. Also, I'm always very happy to entertain questions in the middle. So if anyone has a comment or a question, please feel free to do that. And I'm just showing you this other example so you get a sense of uh, the different formats of the paintings. This is one painting of a set of 16 by Juan Rodriguez Juarez, where you actually see the family group in a single canvas. Now, what's really interesting, and these are two folios from a 1763 manuscript at the Hispanic Society in New York. They have a great collection. They also have Casta paintings. That um, I was fortunate to publish a facsimile of the manuscript, I think, in 2008 or something. And I bring it here because it just starts to sort of give you a sense of how 
some of these terms were used during the colonial period. So you have this illustration depicting different racial types, and then you have this very elaborate taxonomies. And this is granted a later examples from 1763, but it's kind of, you can see how they're trying to outline the different types of racial mixtures and the different types of names. Many of the names that were deployed in the Casta paintings were zoologically inspired. Terms such as mulatto and mestizo were in use um, with more neutral senses uh, before the 16th century, but by the 16th century, they started being used within the context of Spanish America and colonization, and they started being used to refer to different types of mixtures. Mestizos initially were, um, which is a mixture of Spanish, Spaniards and Indians, was not considered a pejorative uh, type of mixture, but as the century went along, it, was, it started to be associated with illegitimacy. And mulatos was a term that, as we all know, derives from mules, and it has to do with the hybrid nature of uh, animals. And it got applied especially to the mixtures of Spanish and uh, people of African ancestry. And then you have a whole different range that are completely inconsistent um, list of names that were applied especially to the unions of Indians and Africans, and many of them were zoologically inspired as well, such as lobo or wolf, coyote, and then you have uh, terms such as alvarazado, which means white spotted, or chamiso, which means it literally translates as a burned log, and uh, the number just goes on and on. And on. Sambaigo, for example, ninoct. So it's uh, the, uh, the terminology was deployed amply to, as society became more mixed in Spanish, in the Spanish colonies, Spanish American colonies, the terms started to be used quite widely. Now the question here is um, who was concocting these terms? And uh, much of the scholarship has argued that the terms come from a top-down regime. That is, that Spaniards and Spanish legislation was imposing these terms onto the increasingly mixed societies. Um, but the truth is that many of these terms actually originated in day-to-day -day life by people themselves. It's a very complex matter. It's not completely resolved. And there's even new literature, new scholarship, that is arguing that the Sistema de Castas, the names that were deployed in the Sistema de Castas, actually come from the bottom up. That is, that there were a lot of, um, it's part of this new wave of scholarship of giving agency to so-called um, subaltern peoples. And uh, this new wave of scholarship is arguing that um, people actually had much more agency than we give them credit to. That is that they were writing all these petitions to the Spanish crown, uh, trying to resolve all sorts of matters where they actually used some of these terms that the Spanish uh, lawmakers plucked in literally from these documents generated by colonial <coughs> subjects, and they used to shape their own legislation. And that's, uh, that's, I just wanted to bring this because it's important to keep in mind all the different sides of the, uh, the discourse. Now, why was this genre invented? And um, it has to do in a large, large measure with the fact that once the colonizers arrived in the New World, there was, by necessity, a racial mixture. Spanish men came with virtually no women. There was a massive mixture between indigenous women, Spanish men, and uh, African slaves. Um, as a result, many Europeans were starting to describe the populations of the New World as hopelessly degraded. And the paintings, as we will go through in a minute, are in many ways a response to that overarching claim that was coming from European centers of knowledge. But this was also a time when the Americas was discovered of... Um, great interest in peoples that were coming from new parts of the world. This expansionism, this uh, 
reach into other parts of the globe that were not known until then just generated enormous amounts of curiosity on the part of Europeans. And uh, many travel logs, such as this one by uh, Cecchare Vezzelio, started to be generated with um, images that became quite stereotypical of uh, the peoples of different regions of the world. This is, this is actually a really beautiful book. I don't know if some of you are familiar with it, but it's tiny. It has all these different kind of prints, so it's, uh, it's quite interesting to look at. So the Casa paintings, in a way, are responding to that larger interest on the part of Europeans about peoples of the New World. Now, the thing to keep in mind is that the Casta paintings produced in Mexico, most sets, I would say, actually almost all the sets were produced in Mexico or New Spain. There is one set that we know of that was created um, in the Viceroyalty of Peru, which was clearly modeled after the Mexican examples. So that's uh, something to keep in mind too. Um, the earliest extant sets of Casta paintings that we know of, and the corpus keeps getting uh, enlarge as new paintings. It's amazing, but there's a constant flood of new paintings. I probably get uh, emails with new paintings, uh, people telling me about new paintings every two weeks. Uh, some I can match to certain sets, but some are, are, are of entirely new sets, which just, again, it just kind of makes that notion of the corpus of work being so enormous. But this is a terrific work by um, Manuel de Arellano, Again, most of the works were created by local Mexican artists, not European artists. And I say that because some, sometimes people ask me that, and I think I just take it for granted. Uh, Manuel de Arellano is an artist that was very important between the, he worked, he was active between the 17th and the 18th centuries. We don't have a lot of information about him, but there's a dissertation underway in Mexico about this painter, which is very exciting. And this is a painting that is in the Denver Art Museum, which they have, they have a wonderful collection of Spanish colonial art. And what's different about this painting, and this is a rendition of a mulata, is that it doesn't include the family groups in the same portrait. So here you have basically what we would call a racial type. The, uh, what I find also really interesting about this picture is the inscription, which basically says that this is a rendering of a mulata in Mexico City, the head or capital of the New World in the year 1711. And that's a very telling uh, inscription because it speaks to the notion of a sense of local pride. Now, whether this work, and I'm just going to show you, the set apparently had more works. We don't know how many. The work that you are seeing here on the left which is the rendering of a mulatto, you, so you see the couples are depicted in separate canvases, uh, is lost. So all we have to go by is this all black and white photograph from the 40s, I think, 40s or 50s. Um, I wish it would surface somewhere, so if anyone has any notion of where it is, <laughs> please let me know. And um, I find this works really interesting, and I don't know, and it's, um, it's not something that I wrote about in my book, it's something that I've been thinking about lately. There was, throughout the 17th and the 18th century, there was this, um, there were many public festivals. Public festivals, for example, to receive incoming viceroys that took place, they were very ostentatious, they took place in uh, the main plaza of Mexico City, and uh, Different groups of people, different groups, different ethnicities were invited to perform their own identities. So they came dressed as themselves to perform in front of the uh, new incoming viceroy and, um, and submit to, to their rule. And I wonder sometimes if pa these paintings from the set by Manuel Arellano that are so specifically dated to 1711 and are associated with an incoming, the uh, first incoming viceroy to Mexico, uh, might have been part of that whole notion, whether these paintings were actually invented to record part of that, uh, part of a festival. The garment that you see in the mulata, and we were talking about this, that the paintings try to differentiate race phenotypically by sort of distinguishing the figure's uh, skin tonality, but 
also through their types of clothing. And uh, mulatto women were banned from wearing the clothes that Spanish women could wear. So there were very, very strict sartorial limitations to what peoples of different groups could wear. And uh, as, um, as a way to circumvent this measure, and because uh, and we have a lot of documentation from uh, European travelers who visited Mexico, the uh, women from uh, African background devised their own type of clothing. And what we see her wearing here is this very typical type of uh, garment called a manga which was literally just like a skirt fitted from the top that was fastened with these very colorful ribbons and had very exquisite gold or silver brooches. So this became the type of garment that is normally associated with the depiction of mulatas in casta paintings. Part of the same set includes this stereotypical depiction of what were referred to as chichimeco Indians which literally translates as uh, heathen Indians inhabiting, inhabiting the north part of uh, the vice royalty. And um, these are the type of images that were abundant in all the maps and all this kind of cartographic uh, sources describing the different peoples of the world and um, if they even made it to allegorical descriptions of the Americas. But again, the inscription is really telling because they point to Parral, which was an area in the north of Mexico, which was supposed to be inhabited by fierce heathen Indians who would scare Spaniards to death. And this is what you read in a lot of the descriptions. So it's no surprise that some of the, uh, you know, that there's a deliberate attempt to render the figure with his mouth open to suggest the shrieks that are often described in literature that scared Spaniards and other people away, and also the facial scarifications. But again, I have to wonder if this were depictions that were somehow connected to a festival ritual. There is documentation that the first paintings were commissioned by Viceroy Linares, whom you see here on the right, from the very famous painter Juan Rodriguez Juarez, and this is a self-portrait of Juan Rodriguez Juarez, one of the very, very few self-portraits of the colonial period in Mexico. And we know this because there was a letter by a cleric addressed to um, a scholar whose name was Aguiare Yiguren, who at the time was compiling a whole kind of bibliography of Mexican writers and the talent of local intellectuals because the notion that Mexico was uh, degenerate was spreading very much in Europe and there were authors that were claiming that New World talents would ripen very quickly and degenerate by the age of 40. So this incensed many of the local intelligentsia and this one cleric wrote to uh, Egyara Yeguren to please be careful to make sure not to mention that the entire population of New Spain was hybrid and degenerate because it was a notion that was greatly tarnishing local Creole talents. So um, this is how we know that at least, if not the earliest, among the earliest paintings were commissioned by Viceroy Linares. Juan Rodriguez Juarez created two sets of Casta paintings, one which surfaced um, in Bremer, Hampshire in England, and here I'm showing you one example, and um, the other one surfaced in a private collection in Mexico. So again, this is a different type of uh, format where you actually see the individual parents in a single composition. And what's so extraordinary about this earlier works, and I, and I think there's a real change between works that were created in the first half of the 18th century and works that were produced in the second half of the 18th century. The works from the first half uh, are imbued with this very strong sense of local pride. You see all the different uh, racial combinations that um, artists and their patrons were trying to chart out 
but they're all very lavishly dressed, even though they're differentiated through their skin tonality and their clothing, uh, there's a sense of pride in these pictures. The only reason, if you were not even paying attention to the inscription that you can see on the, on the top, really outlining the type of uh, racial combination, one would almost feel inclined to think of this as a European painting of a family group. It's a placid family portrait. And uh, here you see, of course, a Spanish man wearing this typical French uh, three-piece uh, suit with his wig, and the indigenous woman wearing a type of dress which was, uh, or blouse, that was called a huipil, which was a na native blouse. So you're also seeing, again, sartorial uh, emphasis to differentiate the, the different mixtures. I'm showing you here two other paintings from the set. And again, on the left, you can now distinguish, see what type of clothing the, uh, the mulata is wearing, which is the manga. And um, the Spanish man is wearing the, ca the cape and the broad hat, which were only worn uh, by Spanish men. We saw this work. This is a painting from the second set of uh, Juan Rodriguez Juarez in Mexico City. And again, you see here the combination of a castizo and a Spaniard who give back a Spanish woman. And the man, again, wearing the broad hat, the cape, and holding a sword, which was a privilege that was only um, granted to people of Spanish blood. So there are all these little details that really kind of help construct this image of uh, racial hierarchy. It's another painting from the same set. And uh, the one here on the left, I always like to point this out because I, you're seeing sort of the different mixtures now between Indians and blacks, but yet you still see them wearing lavish clothing for the most. And uh, in this case, you even see the little child holding up uh, a hat full of pears, which was a European type of fruit. So the message could be that the new world was so fertile that it was even able to produce fruits of European origin. So there are all this uh, very sort of like cute symbolism to the pictures. After Juan Rodriguez Juarez, the main painter of Castas was a man by the name Jose de Ibarra, who happened to be a mulatto painter. And he was also an apprentice to Juan Rodriguez Juarez. So he's taking up the pictures of his uh, predecessor, but he's doing something radically different here, which is to portray them full length and provide a little bit more information about locale. These three paintings, I'm showing them to you because we just discovered them uh, a couple of years ago. They, they hadn't been published. We showed them at this uh, exhibition we recently organized that uh, called Painted in Mexico. There are three really terrific works that are in a private collection in Madrid. We were just really excited to be able to find them. And um, what I want to notice here, too, what's very much different in these paintings is that you're now seeing the, the sort of the figures from all these different angles. You're even seeing them from the back, which could be considered quite indecorous. But it's a way to sort of provide a bigger glimpse into the uh, types of clothing and also to endow the compositions with a bigger sense of uh, naturalism and uh, make them more dynamic. So Jose de Ibarra, in many ways, was trying to one-up his master, Juan Rodriguez Juarez, through this new set. The possible sources for these works might have been this uh, book by Athanasius Kircher of uh, Colchina Monumentis, which was a book that was widely known in Mexico that had all these different types. And we, um, it's, uh, it's, because the thing is, most Spanish colonial art, most Mexican art at the time was religious. And one has to wonder where were artists getting their inspiration to create this very unusual unique secular genre when they had really no models to, to emulate for it. So the degree of invention is extraordinarily high. And this could be one potential source that we know was widely known in Mexico that 
the artists and or their patrons may have been looking at. I'm pointing out this detail because the emphasis on the clothing is so acute that you almost have to see this in the flesh, but the artists not only try to give you a sense of the different types of clothes that the figures wore, but in this case even incised the paint to give a sense of the texture. So the lines that you see there are fully incised. And the other uh, element that I want to point out is, again, the inscription. The inscription here is barely perceptible. So if it were not for the inscriptions, you would really think of this as placid images of colonial society. And they're not numbered. So, so there's really how you arranged all these different combinations could be quite haphazard. The Castas painting are very much associated too with the fascination with the traditions of local peoples. And concurrently, there were paintings such as this describing Indian weddings and Indian burials. These are attributed to Juan Rodriguez Juarez. And what is really interesting again is that, in the, especially in the image of the uh, Indian wedding, is that you see the Indian couple flanked by their Spanish godparents. So these images, in many ways, are providing a view of society which is regimented, hierarchical, um, but bound by love. And this notion of creating an image of a multiracial society that's fully civilized, organized, and bound by love is a key notion of uh, not only Casta paintings, but this uh, related genres. And this is another really wonderful work by Juan Rodriguez Juarez of an Indian wedding, where you can see even that more explicitly, the couple, the Indian couple is flanked by the Spanish parents, each wearing their appropriate uh, clothing, the dome of the church is seen in the back and the indigenous festival is uh, taking place uh, in great minute detail on the right side of the composition. This is a work by José de Bustos, an artist of whom we virtually know nothing. There's a complete set of his works in a private collection in Paris. And I bring it because the idea of marriage is really rendered uh, explicit in this example. You have the wedding band. So what this is telling us, and it's a powerful symbol, is that these intermixtures, these unions, are not illegitimate. They are, what we're seeing really is the sacrament of marriage. So we're seeing a fully Christianized, civilized view of a mixed colonial society. And that's an important thing to keep in mind when um, also knowing that the painters and the people who commissioned these paintings were probably, they were all local people, the local elite, Spanish and Creole elites. And by Creole, I mean Spaniards born in the Americas. Another possible source for these paintings, which I just love to mention, are these cartas ejecutorias de Hidalguía, which were letters created in Spain, and this one dates from the 17th century, where families are petitioning to their noble status. And it's a link that hadn't been done previously in the literature, but many of these books, and you can see here how they were sort of very uh, luxuriously bound and trying to sort of trace their ancestry as all Christians, um, and included this very detailed family portraits might have been another source of inspiration for the Casta paintings. Now, what happens after 1760 with two artists in specific, Juan Patricio Morlete Ruiz and Miguel Cabrera, is that we see a big shift happening in the Casta genre. We have many more elements being included in the compositions. And what do we see here? we see that the paintings start to be numbered. So if before all the paintings were placed almost, if you will, on equal footing, and you could theoretically hang them in every way you want it, by the second half of the uh, 18th century, you start to see that there's a much more emphatic um, emphasis, there's more emphasis on the hierarchy of these works and in sort of presenting a coherent vision of who goes at the top and who's at the bottom. 
And this, in many ways, has to do with the introduction of the Bourbon reforms at that time, when the Spanish monarchs, Charles III and Charles IV specifically, were trying to rein in the power, their power in the colonies. The colonies had become, to a large extent, self-sufficient. The Spanish monarchy was losing revenue, and they were very anxious about um, losing control of their subjects. So the paintings, in a tangential way, start responding to, um, to this emphasis on demarcating hierarchy. But they are also kind of more connected at this point with uh, the Enlightenment and this widespread notion in Europe um, of creating taxonomies and uh, systems of classification. So it's when you also start seeing a bigger deployment of local fruits and, uh, local fruits and uh, flora and fauna even. And you start seeing more of an association of people with local types of abundance. And this is another really extraordinary painting by Juan Patricio Morlete Ruiz of uh, this marketplace that was close to the cathedral called Plaza del Volador, where you can again see that this notion of abundance and of like uh, equating people with uh, local products, proliferation at the larger level is... Um, is becoming very much, is coming to the fore in many ways. This is even more emphatic in this later painting, which uh, is uh, practically unknown. It's a painting that just got acquired by the New Orleans Museum. It surfaced in the market about a couple of years ago, where you really see the, uh, how different types of peoples and races are placed at the same level of the um, natural world, natural bounty of uh, the colonies. And I wanted to bring these two paintings, which are not Casta paintings proper. They're images that were created in the Viceroyalty of, um, that were created in Ecuador. These are two paintings that we acquired at my museum not too long ago, where you can again see this notion of uh, uniting different racial types uh, with this enormous proliferation of local bounty. And again, it's, um, we can choose to see these paintings as deeply related to the Enlightenment, to Linnaeus, to notions of taxonomy, classification of flora and fauna. But I would also suggest that these paintings that are emphasizing the hyperabundance of the colony is a response to notions that were circulating in Europe about the degeneration of uh, native peoples, um, fruits and vegetables in the New World, for example. There was uh, this kind of expression that was circulating in Europe that described the people of the New World as good colts but bad horses, and uh, which was kind of terrible, but the idea was that people in the New World were very smart up to the age of 40, and then they really just started losing their wits. And they applied the same notion to fruits. They said that fruits were all very beautiful and big and luscious, but once you open them, they were deprived of flavor or substance. So I think that in many ways, this kind of works are a response to those notions that are coming from Europe. And in this sense, it's also good to keep in mind that colonial peoples were very much attuned to what was happening in the metropole and there's this very fluid back and forth between both centers of uh, both centers. And here you can see, you know, that uh, the emphasis on the exterior and the interior of fruits is very much connected to enlightenment projects. And here's a typical image that was drawn uh, as part of one of uh, the famous expeditions of the period by Mutis in the Viceroyalty of Nueva Granada, where the Spanish government had actually sent a whole bunch of people to classify and document the natural resources of the colony because they were really trying to rein in all the um, revenue that they could derive from, the, uh, from colonial context. So the sets by uh, the paintings by Vicente Alban that I was just showing to you are in a way, they also have been tied to uh, the expedition of Mutis. But this is just to give you a sense how this notion um, of fruit, the superabundance of fruit and natural resources in the new world, 
was really an old trope. This is a 17th century source. Another thing that starts happening after 1760 is that you start getting hints of different locations. And I'm pointing out a bridge here, which is directly connected to this major outing uh, in Mexico City that was known as Paseo de Iztacalco, which was a place that was famous, was described often as the second Venice. It was a um, place where all these uh, lakes, um, kind of the, the filled with lakes, and uh, where people of all different backgrounds, it was one of those places where people from all different backgrounds were able to converge. So it was widely described in the literature of the time and uh, by travelers, etc. And uh, it's really kind of amazing how a little bridge that would seem almost nothing to any viewer uh, really carries deep meanings and it would have been very well understood and uh, known by contemporary viewers. Now, also from like the mid 18th century, we have this kind of like different type of Casta painting, and this is a very unusual one by Luisa Men, an artist of whom we practically know nothing, where the sense of local pride is even more so emphatic. The Virgin of Guadalupe was, had just been named patroness of Mexico in uh, 1746, so she's presiding over all the racial uh, permutations, all the different castas of the colony. And to the right, you have a vignette of the Paseo de Iztacalco, and to the left, the Sanctuary of the Virgin of Guadalupe. Now, what I find really fascinating about this painting is that whereas most of the paintings start with a combination of a Spanish man and an Indian woman, here you not only have that the dominating uh, race is a Spanish woman, but that the Indian man in this union is actually a heathen Indian or a Meco. It's one of those stereotyp stereotypical renditions of uh, indigenous people. So we can't totally take all the paintings seriously it's like some of the colonial artists, in my opinion, just as there was satirical literature dealing with the subject, are really poking fun of the system. And that's, uh, there's, uh, some of these paintings are really humorous. And um, they also vary in quality. So it's, uh, it's another, it's one of those uh, aspects of the genre that hasn't really been um, dealt with very explicitly, but the element of humor in these paintings can also be quite, quite significant. Now, the, probably the most famous set of the entire genre is this set by Miguel Cabrera, who was the most prominent painter of the 18th century. The set originally had 16 paintings. When uh, we took this picture, which was about eight or nine years ago, only 14 paintings were known. LACMA acquired this painting about three years ago. I'm very happy about this. It was discovered rolled up under a couch. So it was, <laughs> there were two paintings missing, and this was just sitting in a house in Northern California, and the, those give you a little behind the scene. The uh, owner just reached out, and it's like, I have this painting under the couch. It's like, I see some stuff in Google. I think it's important. So we were really lucky and we were able to acquire it for the museum. And then that meant, um, that meant that only another painting from the set was missing. So after we acquired this work, we did a whole thing in the LA Times. There was an art critic who got really excited about it. And uh, first page of the paper under the line, I was like a whole to-do. And where I had commiserated bitterly that there was still one missing painting. So, <laughs> about a few months later, I got an anonymous letter signed Española, because this is Spanish and Castiza Española. No return address, no nothing, saying, I just wanted to let you know that I am not missing, I just do not wish to be found, and I'm living three miles away from your museum. <laughs> Here's a photo of me so you can get a sense of what I look like. And uh, it broke my heart. There was no way to track this. Um, I waited. I thought, well, if this 
lady or gentleman who sent me this uh, information is trying to tease me, I'm sure she's going to reach out again because she must know that I really would like to have this painting in the collection or just show it. And then I waited about two years, three years, nothing happened. We organized uh, last year our big painted in Mexico exhibition that took place at the Met. And uh, I was so hoping we could include that painting in the show. But this person just disappeared and I just decided to go public with it. So we did this, we got the uh, LA art critic and I told him the whole story, he was riveted. They gave it front page. Lost painting in LA, blah, blah, blah. We even put a note in the galleries. And the painting has still not surfaced. So it's a very sad story up to this point. I'm still waiting. <laughs> but I just want to go back to these paintings. This are, you see very, very clearly the change that's happening with Miguel Cabrera's painting. And the painting of the uh, Spaniard and the Indian who give a mestizo. There's a, I mean, this foreshortening of the Spanish male is really, really something else because you cannot even see the face of the Spaniard. The center of attention, the focus here is the indigenous woman. Um, their child is uh, looking up adoringly to the couple and many of these images, you must kind of uh, associate them with religious paintings of the Virgin and St. Joseph but they're completely secularized. You see the uh, depiction of the pineapple, which was another type of fruit that was typical of the New World. In the back, you see the stall in a market called El Barian, which was the main marketplace at the time, with this assortment of local textiles inscribed the word, with the word Chilotepeque, which was a type of skirt worn by indigenous women. But truly, what's most notable is the emphasis on the Indian woman. And I don't really know, like to read biography so much into art, and we don't. Uh, Miguel Cabrera was perhaps the most famous painter of the 18th century in Mexico, who was probably of indigenous background or mixed background. We, we really don't know. But by the time he became very famous in the 1750s, he started to self-describe as a Spaniard. So that's... Another thing that artists were doing all the time, if um, to be able to elevate their own profession as painters, they had to distance it from the castas. They allegedly were not accepting people of mixed background into their, um, to their academies or their guilds, and to, to um, extol their own place and the nobility of painting, they would often self-describe as Spaniards. Yet, and this is again why I say that there's sometimes an element of uh, trickery to these paintings, of covert, tacit messages. The fact that he's so clearly emphasizing the indigenous women, one cannot help to think about the sort of the more covert messages that were taking place in the genre. And the uh, painting on the right, it's, the same, it's kind of the same notion of the couple standing against their stall at the Parian selling shoes again with like an assortment of typical fruits. And uh, here I'm just showing you another image of uh, Juan Patricio Morlete Ruiz, where you can actually see the big structure that was the marketplace, the Parian in Mexico City's main square, or Plaza Mayor. So just going from the outside to the inside. Here, other two paintings from the set by Cabrera. And doing our seminar, it was really interesting because uh, some of you, I think Hazel and some of the students too, you were pointing out, and I just thought this was a really cool observation, that the paintings are kind of characterized by a certain degree of intimacy. So this notion of being a family unit, of being bound by love is very present, but it's only the parents touching the children. There's no connection between the parents themselves. And uh, that's something that does recur in a lot of the paintings. And it also begs the question as to why. These are two other paintings from the series of Cabrera. And what I wanted to show here is that clothing start to be using also at this stage to introduce the notion of class. So whereas in the 
earlier part of the century, everybody, regardless of their racial makeup, was dressed in the most ostentatious of clothes. By the second half of the 18th century, you start seeing people of lower classes, of lower races, uh, racial combinations associated with class. So you start seeing figures that are wearing tattered clothing, for example. Truthfully, the genre explodes by 1770. After 1770, there is the bulk of the paintings were created, some signed by artists who are known and most of them by anonymous artists, which tells us that there was an increasing demand for these works which uh, were probably, was probably connected to the uh, spread of cabinets of natural history in Europe, people who were coming to the New World, such as viceroys and other um, ambassadors who came for short periods of time and then they wanted to go back to Europe with a souvenir of their, stay to, of their stays in the colony. And what we see here, uh, this is a set by Andres de Islas, who happened to be an apprentice of Miguel Cabrera. Also, there's very little work by him, but for some reason we have two casta sets, full casta sets signed by him. You start seeing that whenever you see a Spanish man, the family groups are situated in such a way that you, it's essentially in scenes of leisure. So they're either performing music or you can see that they're literate. Other family groups include uh, the playing of cards, for example, in a contrived uh, setting. And um, I bring this one, too, because during the Bourbon reforms, the uh, Spanish monarchy was really trying to control revenue, and uh, playing cards was a royal monopoly. And there's a lot of descriptions of how playing of cards was causing great trouble in the colony, was creating great unrest, but yet the Casta paintings always show them with a Spaniard, in a very contrived setting. And the famous images of uh, nursing. This was a time, these are some of the most difficult images in a way because the, uh, the literature talks a lot about the problems with using wet nurses. It was uh, wet nurses of indigenous or African background because there was this whole notion that the children would imbibe the bad vices uh, with the milk of their wet nurses. So at this time, and it was a very sort of widespread discourse at the time, so what you see occurring during this uh, decade is um, showing family groups where the Spanish man is overseeing the nursing of their wives for the most. So it's, uh, it's, the message was very powerful. And just in case you didn't know that color was not enough, Sartorial emphasis, clothing was not enough. Now you start seeing moral att attributes ascribed to the different types of mixtures. So the mixtures of Spaniards and blacks, which was seen as the most, um, the one with the most potential to corrupt the whole system, you actually see scenes of violence. And so the, uh, this kind of scene, which is recurrent in paintings after 1770, are really admonishing vignettes, telling people what the improper or the less desirable type of mixture would be. And I'm just showing you some others so you can see that how prevalent the scene was. And the other thing that you see happening at this time is again the emphasis on trades. Because if we think of the paintings in connection to the Bourbon reforms, this whole notion of uh, deriving larger revenue for the Spanish crown becomes really imperative at this time. Okay, so that is basically an overview of the paintings. I'm going to just show you very quickly to wrap it up the category of albinos. Somebody in the class was asking, and I didn't want to give too much in, but Albinos became, they start appearing since the early paintings in the early part of the 18th century. But it became one of those categories that became much more prevalent in the second half of the 18th century. And here you're seeing again the LA County P Museum painting on your, your uh, left. Um, they're both from Miguel Cabrera. 
And they're really interesting because the children are whiter than white. So if you didn't have an inscription, you would almost take this to be a Spanish child. But there was a virtual obsession with the albino category at this time. And it was also, um, it was also a racial category that was being widely debated in European circles, mostly because they didn't know what to do with it. They didn't know how to fix it. Albinos uh, in European circles, uh, by some intellectuals, were discussing them as a different race altogether and if, uh, a species that could not propagate. And that's a really key thing. Albinos could not propagate. But another kind of line of uh, discourse was that albinos were born mainly to people of African descent and that they exemplified the return to the, the, return to the so-called primeval white color of mankind. So it was, um, it was in connection to that whole concept. People really didn't have the sort of the language of genetics to, to discuss these things, and they were really obsessed with this category. So in the painting of Espanol and Albina Tornatras, you have this couple with a darker child, Tornatras literally meaning return backwards. So it's the idea that albinos, although white, they descended from people of African origin and their children would return, would jump backwards in the racial scaffolding. They would keep moving towards blackness as opposed to whiteness. This is a really incredible painting that tells the story so well by an artist uh, whose name was Jose de Alcibar. It also just recently surfaced in the market. And um, you see the two parents, ostensibly white, and the, mom is, the mother is nursing this very dark child. And then on top of that, you have the woman in the back who's pulling up her glasses to verify that what she's seeing is exactly correct. How could two white parents beget a darker child? So these are the kind of, uh, kind of inner jokes, if you will, of the paintings. They, they are laden with a sense of humor, but they were also very... Uh, telling in regards to sort of like more ample discussions that were taking place across the Atlantic. They're really espousing the idea that albinos are not uh, sterile, as some people claimed, as they're incorporating them into this entire uh, web of social mixtures. There was also the notion that albinos could not see that they, their vision was very poor and they were very feeble. And here you see this very unique scene that also recently surfaced in the market where the child is kept in a dark room and you can tell that because there is a candle in the back. And uh, the ambivalence of the scene is quite remarkable because you have this, the, the man at the door, ostensibly the parent, uh, giving a coin to the older woman and you don't really know if he's, uh, the sort of the domesticity is very confusing because you're not sure whether he's providing money to support his child or if he's paying money to see this freak of nature, as they were often referred. So I'm going to close there. And... Uh, yeah, I'm just going to sort of finish there because it's been an hour and, uh, and I'm open to questions. I, this is a very broad overview and we just have to do it in 45 minutes, but uh, I hope it touched many of the issues that the paintings raise. Questions? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, in the back. Hi. Um, a couple of things. You used this phrase, return backwards. Yes. Uh, in the American South, there's an old piece of racial vocabulary, which is the throwback. Yes. And I suppose that's what would be an analog to return backwards. Yes. Yes, Absol yes. absolutely. Yes. Right. A second question is, <clears throat> are you... Um, Familiar, are you aware that there might have been uh, a similar genre in other colonial outposts in the New World, French outposts, Dutch outposts, or is this specific to the Spanish um, experience? Uh, 
Yeah, that's a really great question. It's very specific to the Spanish, to the Iberian world. That's what makes the genre so unique. And in fact, you have people like Edward Long, who was uh, described, who wrote a book about Jamaica, who, I mean, this was, this paintings must have been so popular that even he had as a passing note in his book about Jamaica, about how the Spaniards had invented all this casta terms and that they kind of made it, a, made it into a science. So this, uh, yeah. But it's a, it's a very it's just very typical of uh, the Iberian world. There are other depictions of uh, different ways of portraying racial bodies in uh, other parts of uh, the world, but not exactly through this metaphor of the family group and the sort of successive generations. Yes. I have two questions. Can we go back to the immediately previous slide, please? This one. Yes. Yes. Um, so in the spirit of uh, what you uh, stated at the outset about the multiple possible interpretations of an image of this kind, I'm curious to know if, if there were, if there was um, a discourse in Mexico in the 18th or 17th century that might look at this image and suggest, well, what this is really telling us is that the, uh, the Spaniard is not the father of the child. Uh. <laughs> my, and my other question is, um, in, in connection with that, was there a discourse in Spain that was transmitted to Mexico about who and what is a Spaniard? Since after all, um, as you said, the Spaniard is being held up as the pure, yeah. um, but uh, surely there was recognition in Spain of... Yes. of um, multiple ethnicities have been blended to create the Spanish people? Yeah, those are really two excellent questions. Um, I try, the, the, just in response to the first one, there was this, uh, obviously some of the painters were really keen on emphasizing this knowledge of, this, uh, this concept of marriage, right? Of showing that these are not illegitimate unions. But when you see paintings like this specifically, and this is where you have like the older woman just kind of looking kind of like, what is this? You, you, you wonder, and this is why I think it's much better to leave uh, some of these questions open and then pose them. But we, we, you, how they were interpreted in their own day is uh, it's a very difficult thing to approach. So we, we're bringing our own baggage of knowledge and it's weird. This is very largely inferential world. And even I imagine that even back in the 18th century, people who would have seen the same image would have come out with different uh, interpretations. It's just human nature. As to the, uh, your question about the Spaniards, um, it's really interesting because Sp <laughs> There was this notion of raza in Spain that was this concept of raza or race that was used in Spain in the medieval period to distinguish between nobles and plebeians or pecheros, tax payers. And um, in the 1500s, it, was, it started to be used not so much to distinguish between nobles and, um, and uh, tax payers, but more between old Christians and new Christians. There was this whole phenomena of uh, conversos at the time, Jewish converting to Christianity, and with it came a great deal of skepticism about the truthfulness of these conversions, and we have to remember that this coincided with the rise of Protestantism, with the encroachment of the Ottoman Empire, with the Counter-Reformation. So the Spanish, uh, the Spanish monarchy was living through a great period of instability and utter anxiety. And to be able to preserve the prerogative of uh, noble Spaniards, they started labeling on the concept of race to religion. So there was this notion that to become a full, fully integrated old Christian, you had to wait three or four generations. And this had very real repercussions in practical life because to be able to be accepted into uh, the church or other institutions that demanded proof of your 
limpieza de sangre, or your purity of blood. You, there, there were like massive, um, massive questionnaires where people would just go out and interview everybody they know to find out if a certain individual <coughs> really went back three or four generations um, and they could be considered all Christians. So what I find really interesting is that this religious notion of all Christian versus new Christian, when the um, encounter with the uh, Spanish <coughs> colonies occurs, they're sort of labeling that system onto the races. So in other words, you have the system is being secularized. So now it's not that you need three or four generations to become an old Christian, it's that you need three generations to become a pure Spaniard. So those, yeah, those are, those, those are really great questions. Anyone else? Yeah? Classes about how only Spanish men were allowed to wear like the broad beard hats, but I noticed um, in one of the paintings, like the Castiza son was wearing a broad beard hat. So was that more about the fluidity of his race, or was it more about like uh, the status of his father? Yeah, that's I. I don't know which painting you're referring to, but I'm not surprised uh, because Castizos were just one step away from being a Spaniard. So it's, uh, it would make sense. And again, there's, um, I think because these paintings are so well charted, we ourselves have that need almost to kind of understand things in a very strict way. But the paintings are, are all over the place. The, the vignettes are all over the place. So just when you think you have it right, there's a painting like Mena where you see the Indian, sort of the Indian, heathen Indian marrying the Spanish woman. So it's like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, in the back. I have a question which might be a really good. Where were these paintings placed? Like, where were they displayed? And like, for whom were they displayed? Yes. The, uh, I wish we had more information. But the, uh, we do know that the paintings, some of the paintings were taken back to Spain and they were, they were uh, displayed in cabinets of natural history. We know, for example, of a famous uh, bishop in Mexico, Lorenzana, who went back to Toledo and he created his museum of uh, cabinets of curiosity and he had some paintings that he exhibited there. Um, there are any number of cabinets of, natural, of uh, curiosities throughout Europe that had this painting. So I think many of them were produced for that context. Others, um, others were just collected by people who came to the New World, took them back, and they were probably in their, pala in, in their palaces or their houses. But we don't have a lot of concrete information. I mean, we, I haven't encountered a single description of where these paintings, how they were displayed or how they ordered them. No, I just recently found a newspaper clipping, which is from the, uh, it's from the 19th century actually of a sale in one of the auction houses in London, where they're actually publicizing the sale of this amazing paintings by Murillo of all things. It's a big page about this famous painting by Murillo that's being sold in Bond. And then at the very bottom, and we have this fascinating series by Cabrera of Casta paintings, also in view and blah, blah, blah. So this, that came from a, the family of a very notorious aristocrat in Spain. But they're very, there's just this, they're just a spattering of references. Yeah, yes? I was curious if you could talk a little bit more about what you think about why this seems to be almost kind of a uniquely Mexican phenomenon. As opposed, you said there's sort of one one off Ecuador or Peru, but why isn't it sort of a larger genre in Peru and across the colonial world? Yeah, that's a that's a it's also a really wonderful question and really hard to answer. It's uh, <laughs> the chicken or the egg. <laughs> um, In part, I think, you know, it's, I, I think it's, but if my Andeanist colleagues heard me, they would kill me, so I don't think I should say this. But I think there was a much deeper, and a, a much more deeply entrenched pictorial tradition in Mexico that there was in other parts of the Viceroyalty. 
And um, Mexico was a real center of power at that time with a very sort of organized group of uh, intelligentsia. And if these paintings were created at least initially as a reaction to the criticism of uh, hybridity in the new world, I could see why they were created there. The only reason there is a Peruvian painting is because there was a huge amount of travel back and forth between people in Mexico and Peru. And I'm pretty positive that somebody from Mexico traveled to Peru and just mentioned, you know, how or even brought with them a, a, a set of Casta paintings. And Cristóbal Lozano, who was the most prominent painter of the time, was commissioned to paint it by the viceroy of the time. And that's, but that's it. That's just a one, one off. But I really, it's a great question. It's epistemologically, I think I just, I just can't answer. <laughs> yeah. Um, in 1830, in Brazil, an Austrian wrote a thesis about the uh, how to write Brazil religion history, and he proposed the idea of uh, quite in three generations too. But the demographic, the demographics at that time, where the 80 percent of the population in Rio was black then it was a kind of optimistical ideal. Then I'm worrying about the represent, like this gap between the representation of phenotypes and the, 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 like the demography of these groups. And the second question is about this uh, Dutch painter, uh, Albert Eckhout, um, who painted some casts in, uh, from Brazil at the Mamelucos and like many groups, and if there's a circulation of his work in in Mexico, like to inspire this kind of the the fiction. Yes, yeah, yeah. The uh, the Eckhart paintings were commissioned by Nassau, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, I I see your point. I don't think there was a connection between Eckhout and the Mexican paintings. I think, you know, there was, as I was trying to point out with the travel books, there was a virtual obsession with trying to understand what people across the globe looked like. I mean, we, we have to remember there was no television, there was no, <laughs> like no Netflix, nothing. So uh, the way to gain some knowledge was through paintings and books is... Um, so different places documented the diversity of the population in different ways. But I don't really see a connection between the beautiful Eckhout paintings uh, and the Dutch colonies and uh, the Mexican ones. There is in the sense that they were also obsessed with uh, documenting images of albinos. And that's, uh, that, was, uh, that was just very much in the air across the Atlantic at that time. It was a really hotly debated topic in the period. Did I answer, did I answer everything? Okay. Anyone else? Okay, well, thank you so much. Okay.